So my name is Johan Faisi, I'm from the University of Dundee and there I'm the director of a centre called the Centre for Environmental Change and Human Resilience and much of my work is around how we adapt to change, how we're resilient to change uh, and those kind of issues in, a, in the context of sustainability. So what I'll be talking about today is uh, how communities in remote areas of the Solomon Islands adapt to change and the implications of that for dealing with issues like climate change and the wider sort of changes that are happening in, in global terms. Very much this is a, uh, an issue about raising questions as much as it is about providing answers, but particularly about how current contemporary societies are dealing with change. Great, well thank you very much, it's great to be here this evening uh, and thanks very much for coming because I know it's the time of year when everybody's out rushing to get their Christmas presents um, and I haven't got mine yet but there we go, I'm getting there um, and uh, it's really nice to be here on, 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 especially given the weather so thank you very much for inviting me to be here, it's great. Um, as, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as has been kind of introduced, I have a fairly undisciplined background. I actually started off as a zoologist many years ago. I moved into kind of interested in understanding how, we, how do we understand what we know? How do we kind of engage with understanding what environmental change might be or various different guises around that? And I got very interested in the, in the, the concept of experiential knowledge as opposed to scientific knowledge and what does that mean? How do we kind of get our heads around that? Um, a longer kind of story, but eventually I kind of moved into looking at environmental conservation, the role of practice in conservation, got into environment and development, and that kind of led me uh, to the Solomon Islands. The first time I was there was in 2005, and I've been there a number of times. Last time I was there was in 2011. And really what I'm going to do today is, is tell the story uh, I'm not going to go much into the kind of scientific kind of aspects of what we did or the research aspects per se, but I'm going to tell you a story of, of, of kind of what we found in the work that we did there. And it's all about change. And the, this story really, if I, if I retitle that title, I would call it Change is Changing. And that's the kind of what, what the local communities are experiencing in, uh, in the Solomon Islands where we've worked. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to take you through the story of the Solomon Islands and then towards the end, I'll draw it back in relating to what does this, the learning about how people respond to change, how does that, what does that tell us uh, about what we might be doing in terms of how we're responding to change at the moment, relating to COP21 or to the increasing work that's going into looking at resilience in communities in various guises or health in various different ways as well. So it's quite an open general talk. I'm not going to give lots and lots of details, but, but hopefully you'll find the story uh, of interest in general. Okay, let's see where we are. Okay, setting the scene. We know the world is changing. We know the planet is changing. We've got major kind of challenges that are starting to, to affect us in terms of climate change. Uh, and that's really the backdrop to this talk is that um, uh, if we really want to address things like climate change or contemporary, contemporary kind of global challenges, whether it be obesity, whether it be addictions, these are all kind of sorts of products of the current way in which society is organized. So the backdrop to this talk really is that if we want to really kind of address these things, we have to be thinking in fairly transformative ways about how we address society. Tweaking around the edges is not going to solve the problem. Using the same tools and methods to address the challenges that we've got that we've that kind of created them in the first place are not going to address those challenges. So really the backdrop to this is that the world is changing. We don't know what the future is going to look like. We have some real in interesting opportunities in terms of shaping that in various guises. But then there's lots of questions about how do we shape that? If we, if we accept that premise that significant change is needed, how do we go about doing that? And, and so the backdrop to this really is about about this sort of processes of change that are affecting everybody around the world in various different kind of ways. And what I'm going to talk to about is about this. This is your kind of you are here kind of uh, statement um, uh, uh, in terms of where I'm going to take you today. This is the Solomon Islands up in this point up here. This is Papua New Guinea, the top of Australia. So you're about two and a half thousand kilometers uh, northeast of, of Brisbane in Australia. It's about three and a half hour flight from from Brisbane to get to the Solomon Islands. The Solomon Islands are, are these, these last six islands, six large islands-ish, that come off this, uh, this uh, Papua New Guinean archipelago. It's bordered also by Vanuatu as its next neighbor, and then you've got Fiji down here and, and New Zealand at the bottom there. So that's where the Solomon Islands are. It's not a very well-known kind of place. Um, it's got a population of about 650,000 people, something like that, uh, probably, kind of the, the, the land area is about 
Um, I think the population density is about one hundredth or one, sorry, one tenth of the UK. So it's, it's, it's much lower population density overall. It's a relatively large area. This is a picture of um, a map of languages, right? Now, so you've got Papua New Guinea. Here's the Solomon Islands in this square. There's 70 odd different languages in the Solomon Islands. I'm not talking different dialects, I'm talking different languages. 70 different languages. In fact, Solomon Islands, if you look at languages per capita, is the second most diverse country, culturally diverse country in the world. Its neighbor, Vanuatu, has got 110 languages and just 350,000 people. If you stick Vanuatu together, Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, you end up with 11% of the world's languages in a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the population. It's incredible, incredibly culturally diverse. So calling that a country just doesn't really make any sense because these guys are far more closely related to the other islands up in like Bougainville Island up there um, than they are um, to, to other parts. So there's this massive diversity and, and language and culture and the, and the way in which they're, they're interacting with the land and their dependency on the land is a really critical kind of part of understanding kind of what's happening in these places. A very, very brief history of the Solomon Islands. 30,000 years ago, something like that, people were in the Solomon Islands, so they've been there much longer than we have been in the UK. Um, all sorts of kind of um, various complex cultures around these different languages emerged, some of them very tightly woven with practices of, um, of, of warfare and tribalism and uh, very kind of close um, communities that, that gave rise to these different languages. Very also high, high species endemism, sort of biodiversity, species that you only find uh, in the Solomon Islands. There's, there's a lot of species that you only find in the Solomon Islands. So there's a very strong correlation worldwide between the species endemism, local species, and languages, interestingly. So not surprisingly, the, the way that the languages have emerged is through this um, close isolation. And part of that was driven by warfare. So they were, they were real headhunters. This is the kind of place where headhunters uh, were found. And, and that's a real um, old shrine of, um, uh, uh, from, from the headhunting kind of era. Kind of come to the 19th century, things started to change dramatically. So people didn't really start arriving, Europeans didn't start arriving in, in the Solomon Islands until about the 18, early 1800s. Uh, in fact, I think the first Europeans were 1590, but it took another 200 years before anybody else got there again from, from Europe. So they were quite isolated for quite a long period of time. Uh, and at that time, you basically got traders coming in, whalers coming in, and missionaries. And that started to change things quite dramatically. And so you got the missionaries coming in at that time. There was a lot of blackbirding, which is a kind of process of tricking people to, to, onto the boats to go and work in other places like Chile and Australia, uh, in the cane fields and so on. So the kind of a history of, your usual history of Europeans arriving, then uh, uh, things sort of kind of falling apart a little bit in terms of the structures that were already there. Lots of trading and so on. Does anybody know who this guy is? William Rivers. Anybody come across that before? Has anybody read Pat Barker's book uh, on regeneration? Yeah, if you have, stick your hand up. Can you see? Yep, a few of you. Okay, that was, that was all about William Rivers. Interesting guy. Has anybody read The Ghost Road, which is the last book in the series? One or two. That was all about the Solomon Islands, right? So, in fact, this guy was a real, real guy. He was a, a psychiatrist in the First World War. The story that Pat Barker writes and the novels around that are based on this real person who was based at Craig Lockhart Hospital in, in Edinburgh. And he, tr he treated um, uh, uh, shell shock victims. Uh, in, and, uh, but former, in, in his former life, he was a national, an, an anthropologist. And uh, he was one of the first anthropologists who worked in the Solomon Islands, uh, this very remote kind of place. Uh, and a tiny, tiny little um, uh, island, called, which is now called Simbo Island, which is one of the semi-active volcanoes. And he talks a lot about the, the, the decline in the culture and the, in the ways that the culture is operated and, and how that kind of affected uh, local communities there. It's a fascinating story. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this old book around. I found this copy in a... In a, in a, in a how, how, just pass that around. This is his very famous book. And it's actually about the depopulation in Melanesia. It's about the decline in the populations. So initially in the, 19, in, in the 19th century, there was a massive decline uh, in, in populations in the Solomon Islands. Uh, and uh, this book is all about that. And one of the, um, his, one of his uh, uh, contributions was that 
uh, at that time was that, that psychological factors have a big in play in that. So as the culture changed dramatically, he calls it a kind of loss in interest in life almost, and that he felt that that was a contribution to the, to the, to the changes that were happening in that period. So very interesting, this whole book is about depopulation. Later on in this story, you'll hear about the rising population that's been happening and the effect that that's having as well. So kind of very interesting history in the, to the background uh, of the Solomon Islands. And then this goes on into the Second World War, very famous. The Battle of Guadalcanal was where, um, where the, the advancement of the Japanese was halted uh, by, by the Americans. It's where they came into the war and they started pushing the Japanese back, back up, up through the Pacific again. So a very, very large naval battle, one of the largest in, in the Second World War. Uh, and you can still see many relics from that. And then more recently, in 1999, um, a period of major tension, effectively civil war, um, all to do with land, all to do with who had access to land uh, and, and the, the, the challenges that that created across these different cultures as one island effectively moved in uh, to counteract the, the outward push from uh, key people from the main capital. So there was effectively a civil war between 1999 and 2003. Uh, and, and that, when in 2003, the Australians and, and New Zealanders and, and other Pacific Islanders came in as an intervention force to push that back out again. So there's this whole kind of period of shifting culture, kind of confusion and, 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 and complex kind of interactions between the different cultures in, 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 the, uh, in the islands. Overall, it's a very, very peaceful place. So you get these sudden eruptions of tension that emerge, uh, mostly based around resources and, and land use and ownership around that. Many communities in the Solomon Islands are, are kind of like this, really. This is a, um, a, a picture of a village um, called Runaga village, and um, uh, this is a, a relatively isolated village, but they're very, very basic. R many of them are very basic. They don't have a lot of material goods. Um, they're very, very reliant on the resources that they have around them. So incredibly reliant on the, on the sea resources, the, the fish uh, and, the, and the shellfish. Very reliant on the stuff that they can get from uh, the forest. Very reliant particularly on the food gardens. So they have lots of extensive gardens where they produce mostly um, sweet potatoes and those kind of uh, root vegetables uh, that, uh, for their sustenance. Um, the, the, the huts are actually really well built. They're very flexible, very vent well ventilated. Um, they're leaf huts, but that's a, quite a lot of work to keep those kind of maintained. Uh, and again, they're very dependent then on the sago palm that they use for the leaves around that. Schooling is, there are schools there, but they're very basic, very, very basic kind of schools. Um, and, you know, it's a, a ramshackle, ramshackle kind of type of classroom uh, with very, very limited resources. If they'll have a book if they're lucky. You know, there's very, very kind of limited resources there. But they're very, very much dependent very, then on, on the subsistence livelihoods that they can get, the things that they can get from the materials around them uh, and, and use. When I first went out there in 2005, you didn't see people with shoes, you didn't see torches, you didn't see anything really like that. Very, very basic uh, in the area that I've been working in, um, in terms of uh, the material goods that they have. So the area that I've been, mostly been working is in one of the south, southeastern islands, and it's called Makira Island, uh, and it's one of the poorer islands. It's about kind of 120 kilometers long, 30 kilometers wide, steep-sided mountains going right up from the coast up to about 1,000 meters or so. 1,500 meters, and as you can see in this picture, this is the particular area, it's an area called Kahua, and there's about 30, 40 villages, and they're mostly predominantly located on the coastline. Traditionally, a long time ago, 100 years ago, they used to be located inland. It wasn't safe to be on the coast because of all the warfare and so on. So you can see that there's the, the, the circle sizes, the, the, the actual size of the village, uh, and there's, some, there's about half a dozen large, large villages um, that would have sort of five, 500, 600 people in them. Uh, and really the work that we did is I've been working through a local association called the Kahua Association, which is a, an attempt to try and bring people together from different communities to address some of the challenges that they're facing in terms of things like resource use and so on. Uh, so that's broadly what we've been doing there. And the model that I've, I've been using when we go out there is not to try and do the work ourselves, is actually to engage local people and actually doing the research with us or for us even uh, and actually being part of the, the process of, of engaging with their own communities and, and, and drawing on the expertise that they have in their own understanding of their own kind of situations. And this is a kind of typical picture of um, what you, when you look at Kahua from, from the coastline. And it's kind of an interesting picture. It looks nice and lush and green and it's very pretty, pristine. But in fact, 
that's a highly, highly modified kind of environmental system. Um, so this is a steep-sided mountain. This is probably going up to about 400 meters at the top there in terms of height, straight from the, from the reef at the bottom. There's actually a village hiding and nestling in here somewhere. You can't even see it. You can see all the coconut trees. These are all the trees that are high-valued kind of trees. Um, and then there's a lot of, lot of vines. So you can see a lot of um, areas where uh, trees have been cut down and vines have grown very quickly above that. So highly, highly modified. The other thing you can see in here is um, you can see some food gardens. You see that little brown patch up on the, on the top there? Yeah. So that little brown patch is a food garden. So they clear the area for, and, and they plant their, their, their produce um, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and then they rely on those as, as a source for where their food comes from. The white trees, that's interesting. There are no large trees left in this place. And these are kind of medium-sized trees. The only reason why these white trees are there is because they're nut trees, they're gnarly nut trees. And uh, so the trees that have a value other than timber remain. Anything else is already gone. So this is a highly, highly intensely used kind of environment. And um, what the um, communities have been finding is that uh, they're increasingly experiencing the change in the sense that there's a reduction in, in, uh, in all sorts of things that are happening. So they've got a reduction in the yields in the gardens, the amount of food that they get out of the gardens. So they might plant the same things, follow the same rotation patterns, but they're getting less food out of it. Interesting. Um, there's a reduction in the space for gardens. There's increasing pressure to have more and more gardens. And when you've got uh, more space for gardens, it, or, sorry, less space for gardens, then, then you're struggling to get the same rotation patterns that allow that, that land to regenerate. So that's one of the uh, reasons why they're getting a reduction in the yields of the gardens. When they've got less space for gardens, they're having to put them higher up on the slopes, on steep-sided slopes, so they're more prone to landslides and, and things like that. So lots of changes happening along there. Building resources are declining. They don't have enough timber. They're having to walk much further to get any timber to get that out if they want to build a house. And then marine resources are declining. It's very difficult to manage the shellfish uh, and the pelagic fish that they get from, from the oceans outside. This is a kind of typical picture of, a, a, you know, if you go inland a little bit, you see the banana leaves in here, massively modified, intensively used kind of environment. And these are the, the sweet potato kind of planted kumara that's uh, at the bottom there. So lots of changes in terms of environmental changes that are happening. One of the ways that they're responding to that change then is, um, is that they are, um, one of the only real options that they have when they're dealing with these kind of declines is to try and make cash to generate income with the hope that they can either send their kids to school or that they can buy some imported food in as well. And the only real two ways in which they can make money in this place are dried coconut, which is called copra, which is sold on, on an international market, but you don't get very much money for that at all. Pittance, really, for the amount of work that's going in there. And you can see this is a drying shed where they've taken out the, the, the coconut meat and they put it in the top of that, that shed and they put a fire underneath to dry it. And then this is cocoa beans. Cocoa beans is a slightly higher um, uh, uh, value kind of produce, but there's a very limited place where you can put that. You need much more fertile flatlands uh, to grow your cocoa trees. And so what's happening is they're trying to kind of respond by generating cash income in order to kind of uh, d deal with these sort of things. This is just a little picture of um, some guy who's uh, got his sack of uh, copra, that's dry, the dried coconut. That's a 90 kilogram sack. I couldn't even lift that sack. And this guy's wandered down the beach with this into the, into the water in, in, dodgy, in, in kind of un, uneven sand and actually putting it in a boat. They're tough. You know, these guys are really, really tough. And, and uh, they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty impressive people when they, when, they, uh, when they start operating. The other really big change that's kind of feeding into this kind of story is the population. The population is growing. Um, it's growing, it has been growing dramatically for the last sort of 30, 40 years. Um, and uh, there are kids everywhere. I mean, we, we, I could give you some figures about the population growth, if I could remember them. Uh, but they're you know, pretty dramatic in terms of the sort of doubling rates that are happening at the moment. And that's putting a huge pressure on the kind of availability of the resources in their immediate kind of uh, areas that they're living in. I spent a long time talking to um, uh, people and we were trying to understand, by talking to many, many people there, why was the population now growing? If you remember, Rivers' story was all about, oh my goodness, the, we, we've got a decline in population. That was their worry in the 1920s. And now there's a massive increase. And basically the, the, the elders and, and many of the, and the women kind of really came to the conclusion that 
You know, in the past, it was really difficult. There were natural processes that, that kept population low. So just simply, if there was a, a conflict, you could literally only have as many kids as you could carry. If somebody was running into your camp and attacking your camp, you had to pick up your kid and off you went. You know, the things like that that were going on all the time, the fact that people didn't live on the coast uh, was, was, uh, was really difficult. It's very hard living in, in, in the forest. Uh, away from the coastline. So all these sort of changes have allowed that, that population to rise. Some simple introduction measures to, to, to reduce malaria have had a big impact. Some basic kind of sanitation measures brought in partly by the missionaries uh, has had an impact. Although that's a complex story because as Rivers points out, the, actually when, when, when clothing was brought in, that became a problem because uh, the, although the, the local people would bathe regularly. When they had clothes, they bathed less. And when they did bathe, they just kept their clothes on because they only had one set of clothes. So there was kind of a complex thing going on there in terms of sanitation and health around uh, those sorts of challenges, which is complex. There's, there's no doubt that the population is putting a lot of pressure on, on, uh, on the local environment, which they're immediately dependent on. And that then requires more space for food gardens and so on and so on. The other kind of part of the story is, um, is this one. It's a really interesting book, this one, um, written by a, an anthropologist called Ross MacDonald. And he says, money makes you crazy. So it's a story about kind of strange tales of, of how money has kind of influenced um, strong kind of reactions to generating uh, uh, material goods in various different guises. And um, it's a complex process. We are all part of, we are all kind of um, uh, affected by our own desires for material goods no matter where we are. We're human beings in that sense. And, and often that's a, a key challenge that how we, how we reduce our kind of desire of material goods. Um, but from, a, from an outsider like myself, you kind of come in and you see these really strange reactions to, to, to material goods. It seems like every, everybody gets kind of crazy over money or, or things like that. One of the interesting stories was a, um, a, a, a Catholic priest who'd lived in this area for quite a long period of time and he said that they used to have a ship. And he said, the ship, oh, crikey. He said, the, the ship that they had, so the, the idea of the ship was that you could take the produce from the islands and take it to the markets, right? So they had this thing set up along those lines. And out here, there's this mythical sense of a ship. If you start talking about a ship everywhere, ships, ship is the answer to all our problems. If we've got a ship, we can generate the income. We can get the cash in. It, the cash will start flowing. That's the kind of idea. Um, they, and, and, and so this guy, this Catholic priest says, oh, this ship, when we had that ship, it was really expensive to run. We couldn't keep it running. He said, every time the ship came into our, in, in, into our, into our little village where I was, he said, I used to just hide under the table because I just couldn't cope with the, the chaos that would ensue when the ship came in. And so there's all this kind of sort of stories about how, how, um, how produce would arrive and how uh, income would be generated re relatively quickly. And it kind of comes kind of through this sort of strange tales of desire. And if you look at some of the kind of origins of, of where this kind of craziness comes from, there are three kind of points, really, that I'm not an anthropologist, so I'm not going to profess I've got this entirely right. But in a sense, um, in Melanesia, the area that we're talking about, uh, there's often a, a sense that ancestors control production, right? So that's the ancestors where things come from. So when the Americans arrived uh, in, in the Second World War, they brought so much stuff, tons and tons of stuff, chocolate, motorbikes, tanks, you know, you name it, it was all there. And there was a strong belief in certain areas and cults kind of developed around the notion that, that this stuff had been waylaid by the ancestors and was actually due for them. So it kind of created these complex kind of things and cults that emerged around that kind of stuff. Also, um, uh, in, in Melanesia, many people seek to be inspired rather than being the source of creativity themselves. So they might be thinking, well, if I have a dream, uh, that's, that's the source of my created creativity, if you like. And um, so you get these kind of often prophetic kind of, kind of um, mass hysteria kind of things that emerge. For, for us, from the outside, look completely crazy, but make complete and utter sense uh, from the local people there. The other one that's really interesting as well is that, that time is, the conception of time might be different too. So time might not be seen as linear. Uh, it's seen as, or progressive. Uh, and so you get the sense where there's, a, there's an ability for social change. Social change can occur overnight. I can become rich overnight. So there's a whole kind of set of things in there that are anthropologically based, ethnographically based, um, that do explain uh, the normal behavior from the sense of uh, Solomon Islanders in relation to material goods and so on. But it creates a complex picture about how people are responding to change. So in summary, in terms of the changes that people are facing, they're many. 
We've got things like changes in resources, food and water. Um, money is coming in. So there's an increased amount of money coming in through the cash cropping. And that's having some really big impacts as money comes in, really massive impacts. It's increasing jealousy and desire. They talked about this all the time. The jealousy and desire and therefore the ability to work as a collective uh, was, de was declining dramatically. Um, access to education and health, yes, that's increasing because there's more money coming into the communities. But one of the really big effects uh, that was happening was this increase in individualistic attitudes. So in the past, when you were in a community, in a village, and somebody said, um, uh, I, I need to repair my roof, people come and help. But increasingly, people saying, well, I'll only come and help if you pay me. Right? So there's a kind of change in, in the way in which people are interacting. There was another Catholic priest who'd been there for 50 years in this place. He was the only guy who, who could write in the local language. And there were only three books in the Cahuan languages. One is the First Testament, one is the Last Testament, and one is the hymn book, right? And those are the three books that he wrote, and he created a whole dictionary from that. And I asked him a question. I said, well, if there's only one thing you could tell me about how this place works, what would it be? He said, oh, that's really easy. In the West, we think, uh, in terms of Descartes, I think, therefore I am. He said, here, though, it's completely different. It's I think because I'm part of a group. And, and that notion that the collective not necessarily cooperative, but collective actions of people was incredibly important. And as that starts to break down, as you bring money in, that completely changes everything. And that's what was, that was a really big change that's happening there. So you get this decline in social cohesion and trust. You get increasing disputes as there's less land to do things on. Um, and the old ways of solving problems uh, no longer work. The ways of bringing communities together and the chiefs just didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to cope with these kind of things. So massive change is happening in these places and happening very, very quickly. Now, these changes can be summarized. Now, this is a very simple diagram because the original one is much more complex, um, but the dynamics are, are, are still, still the same. These can be summarized in a set of kind of reinforcing interactions. Um, increasing number of people increases the pressure on the ecological systems in terms of the environments. It's increasing the stress in communities. People make, are trying to make money to address that problem. They're planting, they're, they're planting cash crops, but that in itself is having an impact on increasing pressure on the environment. So they're planting cash crops in the fertile land, they're having to shift all their, all their gardens up onto the less fertile, steeper side of slopes that are more prone to, to landslides and so on, which affects the yield. So that reinforces the pressure on the ecological systems. At the same time, when they plant cash crops, there's more money coming in communities, but that's increasing this individualistic attitude kind of idea, which is decreasing the social cohesion and trust and in itself reinforcing the stress, which just makes people try and do their individualistic stuff more because they're looking after their self more. So you've got this set of cycles that are happening. When you get more money in communities, also people see stuff, material goods, so they want more money in order to, to kind of fuel that kind of desire in a way. So there's these complex things that are happening in there um, that are, are, are driven by many, many things. But there are three kind of, kind of key drivers. I don't like the word drivers very much. But there are kind of three key drivers that are affecting that. Number of people, intrinsic desire is really important. We're all familiar with intrinsic desire for economic prosperity. But the interesting and counterintuitive thing is that most of the development programs that are really about trying to generate income in communities by generating income in communities, they're also reinforcing some of the challenges and the changes that are happening in the place as well. So our external interventions that are, that are coming into this place are potentially having, well, they're having some positive impacts, but they're also potentially having some counterintuitive uh, impacts as well. And, and that, that's a kind of key challenge in the community. And what you can see in here is that you can, if you follow these through and you go, okay, we'll change, we adapt, we change, we adapt, it's reinforcing itself. And it's actually accelerating what's going on. And one of the, um, uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, really interesting conversations, we did a lot of focus groups with lots of people, using local people to manage them, facilitate them. And there was one group, and, and they, got, they got really, they suddenly clicked, and they said, it's not, because we were asking them, well, what's changing? And they were explaining all the changes. And then in the end, they just said, we really now understand. Change is changing. The change, the, 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 the speed of the change is getting faster. We can't cope with this. We're running to kind of stand still, and, and we're trying to keep up, but the change is, change is changing. We, we can't deal with it. We can't cope with it. And it reminded me of this. Does anybody know who this is? 
Alice in Wonderland, and who's the other one? Red Queen. And can anybody remember, remember why I've got that there? Can anyone remember the quotes about that one? Yeah, that's right. So um, I think, I can't remember the exact quote, but Alice is saying something like, well, in our country, you know, if you, if you run fast, you get somewhere. And the Queen sort of says, well, that's funny because you've got a really slow country because here you have to run fast just to stand still. And if you want to kind of get anywhere, you've got to run twice as fast as that. And, and that, that notion of, you know, if you're running to stand still, but actually you run faster and then you start reinforcing the speed at which everything is happening. And that's exactly kind of what's happening uh, in the Solomon Islands. And this kind of brings us to thinking about um, what does this mean in our context or the global context. This is some work by um, uh, Will Steffen and others. Uh, it first came out in the mid-2000s, and they've been doing some continued work about change in, in the Anthropocene, in, in the current era where human beings are uh, starting to affect literally the, the, the global um, uh, uh, geological and biological processes of, of the planet. Um, and broadly speaking, this is just a bunch of graphs of different variables, of different things. Um, and roughly speaking, where you see a red blob, that's about 1950. And it's showing that all these things are increasing over time. So these are things like carbon dioxide emissions uh, in the top left, methane, uh, domesticated land, terrestrial biosphere degradation, shrimp aquaculture going shooting up, marine fish capture shooting up. All, from the, all roughly from the 1950s. So those biological things and, and uh, geological things are changing. And then these are the socioeconomic trends. So you've got world population, the top left, foreign direct investment, top right, international tourism, all shooting up. All an acceleration of everything that we're doing in, in globally. So there's this acceleration, global acceleration that they're calling the great acceleration. And that we can see that globally happening the Solomon Islands is a kind of microcosm of, of, of that process of change that's occurring. And this kind of, um, kind of leads me to be sort of thinking, well, okay, what, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while. What, what does this mean? We know that change is the norm. Change has always been the norm. Things are always changing, right? Um, but we tend, we're not very good at kind of accepting that. We like to keep things as they are. Um, many innovations kind of we put in place, they kind of... Um, accelerate the change in various guises. We, act, we, we, we have technological advances that keeps kind of running ahead of, ahead of us in some senses. I always feel that as well. I see, look at my students and how technological savvy they are. I'm sitting there thinking, I remember when my grandma, and she, she died a couple of years ago, she was 90, she never learned to use a video recorder. And I thought that was really bizarre. And I was sort of thinking, I've got to get a smartphone because if I don't, I'm going to be completely lost in 10 years' time. So I got a smartphone. But that was the only reason I got I didn't want a smartphone, but that was the only reason I got it because I didn't want to get left out. And, and, and so that kind of sense is we've got to kind of keep up with everything that's happening. And I'm kind of looking at this just too much. We can't deal with it. So um, many of the innovations, if you look at the work was happening, the, the stuff that was happening in the Solomon Islands, the way people were adapting to change wasn't getting them off that treadmill. It was kind of just reinforcing the treadmill. And it's kind of almost creating more problems uh, uh, as well as kind of solving some of the problems as well. But it was accelerating it. Um, and I kind of wonder what, what does that mean for our society in, in, in the West and, and other places. We're actually quite good. I think human beings are actually quite good at adapting to change. We're quite good at responding to something like a flood when it actually happens. We're not very good at preparing for it. And we're certainly not very good at preparing in ways that alleviate the kind of current problems. The irony of the, um, the flooding that we've had over the last weekend was that my meeting that I was supposed to have in the Scottish borders about flood, re flood resilience has been cancelled because of the flooding, right? And, and so we, uh, that's a, a midterm project meeting that we were supposed to be having to decide where we're going. But it's going to completely change the project because of the way in which um, that's going to bring flooding up into the, into the kind of eyes of, of local people in various kinds as well. So we're quite good at kind of responding to um, uh, various things that happen. But, and we're getting better at preparing for things and becoming more resilient to these changes. But most of that resilient kind of work that we're doing at the moment is kind of just propping up the system that we're currently in. You know, if we're, if we're more resilient because we've set up, and this is what some of the council in Scotland have been doing, they've set up uh, systems where there's really bad weather, um, the teachers don't go to their normal school, they go to the nearest school. And you can keep schools open, which allows people to go to work. Fantastic, it's great, we need that because we need, we need people to go to work, we need Place for, safe places for kids to go, fantastic. But we're effectively propping up the economic system that we've become dependent on, which is much of the source 
of much of our unsustainable activities uh, in the planet. So there's this kind of irony in terms of resilience to kind of move faster, resilience to stand still. I, I don't know what we're doing. Are we trying to bounce forward? Are we trying to bounce back? What are we actually doing here? Where does the deeper thinking about what that change might be, might be required? So this leads to a question, well, what kind of change do we need? What is change? What, what kinds of change do we need? And, um, you know, are we about adjusting things, slight tweaking of the, of the system to, to, to deal with things, like the resilience kind of stuff? Are we trying to reform things significantly in some way, maybe some re reforms of, of major legislation and things like that that can have a really big impact? Um, uh, uh, or are we looking at some much, much a deeper kind of transformation uh, in the way in which we operate? I'm going to pose a question to you guys now. Um, I would just be really interested to, um, if you can have a chat for about one or two minutes in two or threes or something, find somebody next to you, introduce yourself if you don't, don't, don't know each other, um, and just have a think about um, what, what are the kind of implications of, of what we talked about in the Solomon Islands in terms of change? What kinds of things are we seeing perhaps here that re might relate to that in some way? And if, what I'll do is I'll draw out, I don't know, five or six, just really quick, short. So think of your answer as sort of three or four or five words, and we'll draw out a few from the audience and the different groups that had a chat. So I'm going to give you about two minutes to have a quick, one or two minutes to have a quick chat about that and see what, what that relates to in terms of the things you're experiencing or aware of. Off you go. Have a go. So I'd, I'd just like to draw out a couple, just, just a few quick points. Not, Try not to make them long sentences or anything, just, just a, a, a few kind of tasters. I think an example here was um, uh, just that we're not dealing with stuff. You know, we're, we're, we've got lots of technology potential, but we're not even, not even looking at that as a, as, a, as a way forward to deal with climate change as an example. So any, anything else that comes out? Anything. It can be anything. I think certainly uh, social norms are driving unsustainable living. Yeah, yeah. I can see parts of Solomon Islands reflected in Buchanan Street. Right, it, can, you, can you expand on that just quickly? Uh, just very briefly, as we rush towards Christmas, people are buying things with money they don't have yep. and to create further social divide. Yep, yep, great, excellent, good example. Uh, uh, what, else? what else have we got? Yep. Um, just working in the NHS, but elsewhere as well, information, the, the fact that you can input so much information, so there's a constant requirement to provide information yes. in order for God knows what. Yes. <laughs> Don't tell me anything else and you, I don't want to know. <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just kind of fueling this kind of system in, in, of knowledge, isn't it, that, that's coming through. What, what else have we got? Any other? Yeah, could you, could, you, could you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Digital's going to save us, but we don't know where it's taking us, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a great, great analogy. Great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you need somebody from the outside to come and go, why are you looking at it like that? And or, or even, but even our, our concept of time, what does that mean? And how is that influencing what we're doing as well? Yeah, is it helpful? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else have we got? Yep. Yeah, we were talking about the acceleration aspects of poverty in Glasgow as well um, and how some wider systemic uh, system, um, trends affect people's um, choices in terms of poverty health-related uh, coping mechanisms um, and, and, and also the, actually land-based lifestyles were the norm here as well. Just to yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot, actually, a lot, a lot happening there as well. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Another one? Yep. Yeah. Oh, they're all coming up now. <laughs> we were talking about football. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> Solomon Islands are bottom of the FIFA rankings. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an interesting saying that they come out of Solomon's when they're playing rugby because they're quite keen on the rugby, not that they're that great at it, but uh, they say that we don't wear shoes because we're afraid of hurting anybody if we do. Um, so they, they kind of, uh, sorry, they, they, no, that's right. So they, they, they have such strong feet that they're, they're very worried about hurting people without, if they don't wear, if they do wear shoes. Oh, I've got that wrong right now. 
You know what I mean. So, so they, they do wear shoes because they don't want to hurt people by wearing bare feet because they're running around bare feet all the time. That's the, that's the thing. Um, right, okay, next one. Just following that, we want to what we can learn from the Solomon Islands yeah. and the relationships of some of the... Yes. Can, just, can you expand a bit? What, well, what, given their culture and how they think and what you've just told us, what can we learn here? From that, just in a different way. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What if they came over and had a look at our... I've always wanted to bring them over and go, tell us how crazy our society looks, right? No, that would be really fascinating. Any more? One more. Yeah, great. This is a slight parallel between the democracy change that we are going to experience in the next 20 years here in terms of reducing working population and increasing older adult population. Yep. And that's not to see that as a burden. Yep. Older adults could have or provide a lot of voluntary caregiving yep. or unpaid care, child care, and all yep. the rest of it. Yes. Yeah. And to over, over age with what is likely to be a number of long term health conditions. So yes. There's a parallel in terms, in terms of, of all that. And, and how is that going to pan out in the future in terms of the dynamics of what's happening there? Yeah, no, that, that's really good. Last one then. Um, I took your idea of being good at responding to change and thinking of there are certain uh, types of change that favour different kinds of people. Yeah. So people that have are able to purchase the technology, yep. the smartphones, yep. and get on that treadmill and keep running with it, no matter how fast it goes. Whereas it doesn't favour those that don't have. Yep. And they get left behind. So you see this growing yep. divergence yep. in society. Yep. And, and, that's ex and that is exactly what's happening in the Solomon Islands. You can imagine those who've got access to the cash cropping or the land to put the cash crops on um, uh, massively increasing their... I mean, the inequalities there, they, it, the face of it don't look very big, but, but they are massive, in, and it all comes down to land and opportunities of land. Um, so there's a lot of kind of issues in, uh, affected by that as well. Great, that's excellent. So, um, so really, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things in there, and I, I could go on forever. Um, I, I, I'm just going to very briefly kind of touch and draw on that. I mean, I think when we're talking about, if we're talking about the change of change, um, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of change do we need? And what kind of change do we want? And this is just um, uh, a bit of work that's come out of uh, Karen O'Brien, who's based in um, Oslo, and she's drawing on uh, Sharma's work, which talks about three spheres, and it just sort of highlights some of the stuff. Well, we can create practical kind of changes, and we're quite good at that. We, we're, we're, we're quite good at producing technological changes, technical changes, the digital, digital stuff and so on. Um, we're quite good at it. We don't do it very well, but we can actually do it if we put our heads together. But then there's also the other changes that need to come through as well, the political. These are the systems and structures that influence the practical. Um, we're really not very good about changing those generally. Uh, and certainly, perhaps even more importantly, we're definitely not very good at changing the values, beliefs, worldviews, assumptions, the norms that are in society and so on that are influencing all of this stuff as well. These changes come slower, but if we really want to address things like climate change and other global challenges, it's at that level that we need to be hitting. And we're not really not very good at knowing how to do that. There are some things out there, but they're um, relatively limited in terms of uh, having significant changes that happen at scale in terms of large-scale population change. Um, and I think this is just a quote that comes from uh, Mark Pelling. He's done a lot of work on resilience. Uh, and he says, perhaps the most profound act of transformation facing humanity as it comes to live with change requires a cultural shift from seeing adaptation as managing the environment out there providing resilience in communities, that kind of thing, um, to learning how to reorganize relationships, pr procedures, and under underlying values in here. And it's that kind of personal shift and change that is going to be incredibly important uh, if we're going to address some of the kind of global challenges that we're dealing with. Um, and really, that just uh, ends my talk. Uh, and this is highlighting, you know, what do we learn from these guys? What would, what would happen if they came and, and pointed their finger at us uh, in terms of saying, well, you know, your world looks pretty crazy too. Um, uh, what are you going to change? How are you going to change? How are you going to deal with the amazing inequalities that you have uh, that, that is incredible given uh, the amount of resources that are available in the kind of countries that we live in compared to places like the Solomon Islands? And in many ways, they're far more advanced than we are in terms of their ability to look after their own communities and, and so on too. So thank you very much. I've really enjoyed the talk. It's been really great to be here. Thank you.